All right, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sonia Berthasel. I'm a PhD student at University of Maine and one of the coordinators for the USDA Northeast Climate Hub's GradCap program. GradCap is a virtual consortium of masters and doctoral students working on climate adaptation in agriculture, aquaculture, and forestry. Today's webinar on aquaculture will run about 40 minutes and will highlight the work of two GradCap scholars. We're very glad you've tuned in. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded for subsequent viewing. It's my pleasure today to um, introduce today's speakers. Michael Aquafreda is a PhD candidate in the Ecology and Evolution Program at Rutgers University and will talk to us about temperature effects and on the survival and growth of farmed Atlantic surf clams. Long Huan Zhu is a PhD student in the Civil Engineering Program at University of Maine and will present on green alternatives to wave attenuation in a changing climate. After both of our presenters speak today, we'll have time at the end for a joint question and answer session. And you're encouraged to type questions in the box on your lower right uh, throughout the presentation so we can refer back to these at the end to help guide the Q&A. And now I'm pleased to turn the microphone over to Michael Aquafreda. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Sonia. Uh, I am Michael Aquafreda. Uh, my co-authors are my advisor, Daphne Monroe, as well as Lisa Calvo and Michael DeLuca. And today I'll be talking about the temperature effects on the survival and growth of farmed Atlantic surf clams. So just a brief agenda. I'll talk about the changes to the Northeast coastal marine environment, and then I'll talk about some uh, research that's currently in review um, the, looking at the effect of rearing temperature on juvenile surf clams. I'll then look at uh, some evidence for heat tolerance selection in surf clam broodstock, and then talk about some of uh, the projects I'm going to be working on over the next few years. So just as a brief overview, I'm sure this won't come to a surprise for most of you, but the oceans are warming. In fact, more than 90% of all human-generated heat is actually stored in the oceans. This figure here from NOAA is showing the difference in average temperature uh, in 2017 compared to the average temperature from 1981 to 2010. And if we zoom into what's going on in the Northeast, you'll see that it's actually worse. The Northeast is warming two to three times faster than the global average. Uh, the Gulf of Maine is actually warming 99% faster than uh, global sea surface waters. And this is going to have profound consequences for not only wild species, but also farm species. So some of the um, uh, evidence for uh, uh, consequences of climate change in, northeast, in the northeast coastal environment is that we see species distributions shifting northward. This is already evident and well documented for my focal species, which is the Atlantic surf clam. So I want to give a brief overview about what the shellfish aquaculture industry looks like in New Jersey. Uh, there are three uh, shellfish species that are commercially grown, uh, two that are dominant and one that's emerging. Uh, the hard clam, uh, which is uh, taking up the left-hand side of the screen, uh, is well established. There are about uh, 30 farm farmers who grow hard clams, and they're typically grown in subtital uh, leases in the back bays of New Jersey. Uh, the oyster aquaculture industry is uh, newer, um, but is really uh, kind of poised for growth at this point. Uh, there are over 20 farmers, um, brings in over, well over a million dollars at farm gate value, um, and oysters are grown either in uh, subtital uh, cages or intertidal rack and bag, as shown in the picture. And then this emerging species, um, or this alternate crop that I'm studying, is the Atlantic surf clam. Uh, it's a coastal species. It's native. Uh, it grows rapidly. It can reach market sizes within about one to uh, like one and a half years, um, and it's really delicious. So farmers are really excited about growing this new species. But surf clams have vulnerability to warm water temperatures, um, and we know that surf clams are vulnerable throughout its development. So I'll just briefly talk about um, the different phases of aquaculture, um, because I think most of the people here are more familiar with agriculture. So uh, bivalve aquaculture uh, is conducted in three phases. There's the hatchery phase, where 
uh, adults are conditioned to spawn and then the larvae are reared. Uh, there's a juvenile uh, nursery stage where juvenile clams are uh, reared in semi-controlled conditions. Uh, and then when the clams are about the size of a dime or a nickel, they're moved out to farms. They're sold to growers who um, either put them out in uh, mesh bags or under nets or screens um, until they're um, large enough to go to market. So from previous literature, we know that larvae are vulnerable to temperatures above 25 degrees with an optimum of 20 degrees. But adults have a slightly different optimal temperature, uh, colder, in fact, 16 to 22 degrees. And temperatures as low as 23, 23 degrees can be lethal. But there is this data gap in uh, the ideal or optimal temperatures for growing juvenile clams. Uh, it's also the most expensive part of aquaculture, this nursery stage. And one of the most expensive parts of aquaculture is the heating and chilling of seawater. So if the ambient seawater in the Northeast is, is suitable for growing surf clams, um, that would make this new crop really be um, more likely to catch on. So uh, I'm going to first focus on the optimal rearing temperature for early post-set juvenile and juvenile surf clams. So a couple years back, I conducted a controlled rearing temperature experiment where I took three independently spawned cohorts of surf clams and exposed them to five different temperatures, ranging from 18 C to 26 C, or 64 Fahrenheit to 79 Fahrenheit. Uh, and these, they were cultured in uh, closed recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, so the water was changed frequently, but the water was uh, cycled between the clams and water baths. So the water would stay constant um, among the, the, the different replicates. The first thing here I'm showing you is the effect of rearing temperature on early juvenile survival. What you'll see is that as temperature increases, survival generally decreases. Um, and, uh, but what, one thing that you'll probably notice is that there's a lot of variation among the different temperature groups. Uh, and, if we zoom into what's going on at the very end of the experiment, we'll see that uh, there's actually substantial variation among the different cohorts. So for example, in cohort B, uh, you have co animals surviving in the hottest treatment better than every uh, surf clam in the uh, cohort B group, regardless of their temperature. So there's this uh, inter-cohort variability that we're noticing with the surf clam's ability to uh, cope with temperature. Uh, and if we look at what's going on uh, with surf clams growth of, uh, when they're reared in these different temperatures, we see a slightly different story. Uh, so for the first two weeks, surf clams that are reared in the warmer treatment actually performed better. But then at the two week mark, two week mark, there was kind of a switch where surf clams in the coldest treatment actually performed better. Um, or rather the ones that were in the intermediate temperatures performed better. And again, if we look at what's going on just at the very end of the experiment, we'll see that there's kind of this Goldilocks regions of cool, warm, and ambient water that promote greater surf clam growth compared to the extreme temperatures. The hot temperatures, we assume uh, the surf clams uh, just can't cope with those warm temperatures, and the colder temperatures, the surf clams grow slowly um, because uh, uh, probably because uh, lower food availability. So taking uh, this uh, information about inter-cohort variability, I decided to look into whether or not heat tolerance was a heritable trait. So I took surf clams from that hottest treatment that managed to survive and raised them up for two years. So these are uh, what I'm calling the heat selected group. Uh, they had this chronic heat stress for one month early after, early after uh, they were uh, metamorphosed. And then I compared them to um, individuals of the same cohort, but were never exposed to chronic temperature stress. There was natural mortality, uh, but it wasn't nearly as uh, dramatic as we see in this heat selected group. So I conducted another control experiment where I exposed these now adult surf clams to different temperatures. And what I found was that there was uh, a significant difference 
in the way that these surf swims are responding to temperature. So the red line is showing the survival of heat-selected surf clams uh, in, in this new experiment. Uh, and their LD50, or lethal dose 50, was approximately eight days. So that's saying that at eight, at eight days, about 50% of the surf clam population in this group has succumbed to mortality. If we look at what's going on in the non-selected group, uh, so remember, these are surf clams that we don't think are predisposed to be um, resilient to temperature stress. Uh, what we see is that their LD50 is about six and a half days. Uh, now, a day and a half may not seem like a lot, but keep in mind that this was a controlled experiment where we were keeping the surf clams at uh, 85 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 and a half C. Uh, so this is warmer than anything we've already, that we've ever observed on our farms. Uh, the water is warming, but not quite this hot. And on coastal farms where surf clams are grown, uh, there's, there's tidal action. So the water temperature is changing at every tidal cycle. Um, it's unlikely that you'll get a constant temperature this warm for uh, um, multiple days in a row, let alone a week. Uh, so we, we think that this would have, um, that this difference between the two groups would be even more dramatic in natural conditions. So uh, taking this uh, you know, pilot study, uh, we have some future directions that we, can, that we are encouraging to, that we, that we are looking forward to doing in the next uh, year or so. Uh, and those uh, two aspects of surf clam culture that we're going to be investigating are breeding for greater thermal tolerance or greater heat tolerance, and also looking at what's going on um, in the surf clam transcriptome when they're under heat stress. So uh, selective breeding for uh, more robust shellfish stock uh, is a common practice. So we currently at Rutgers University uh, develop uh, disease-resistant disease oyster stocks. Um, there's also oysters that are uh, bred for um, uh, shell shape and also uh, fast growth. So uh, breeding uh, shellfish is nothing new, but breeding surf clams for greater heat tolerance is something that we're going to be trying over the next year or so. Uh, so we'll take a big population of surf clams, expose them to a, a heat stress, save the survivors, um, compare them to a non-selected group, um, produce offspring, and then compare their offspring over two or three generations. Uh, we'll also be looking at the surf clam transcriptome under heat stress. So surf clams will be, in this time, exposed to kind of a sublethal stress, to, and then the clams will be sampled. And we'll see what kind of gene expression is occurring. Are certain genes upregulated or downregulated during the sublethal stress? After that, we'll cool the clams down to kind of normal conditions, and then in a few weeks, re-expose those same clams. And we'll see if they have a different response. So do more, do the genes that had turned on, turned on more quickly, or is there some kind of other molecular memory of prior heat exposure? Um, and uh, on the bottom of the screen, uh, I'm just showing what happens to a clam when it's in warm water for, for very long. On the left-hand side, you have a happy clam that's filtering the water. As they um, stay in hot water temperatures for a uh, an elongated period of time, uh, they start the, the edges of their shell start getting very soft, making them more vulnerable to predators. Um, they lose their ability to um, regulate the fluids in their tissues, so their foot becomes uh, flaccid, and then also eventually their entire body starts breaking down as their protein as their proteins denature, uh, and they become this gross soupy mess that's not very delicious. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, surf, clams, uh, surf clam juveniles grow best at 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, colder temperatures increase survival but tend to slow growth. And uh, temperatures that are kind of in the intermediate range between 20 and 23 degrees promote greater, greater growth. Um, notably, cohorts exhibited uh, substantial variation. And uh, we use this as evidence for um, potentially looking into surf clam uh, breeding programs for, for developing greater heat uh, tolerance. Currently, as it stands, the Northeast 
ambient seawater is more than sufficient for commercial surf clam production. Um, I've been able to grow um, over 2 million surf clams for the past couple of years at our hatchery at the New Jersey Aquaculture Innovation Center. Um, so I look forward to tr uh, transmitting my uh, research to local farmers in New Jersey, but also in states along the Northeast um, and, and letting them know that surf clams are a, a viable new crop that they can, they can try. Uh, but it should be noted that surf clams are um, vulnerable to heat stress and will certainly be vulnerable to climate change. So we're currently uh, conducting research to look at surf clam heat tolerance and also looking at the surf clam transcriptome, the certain genes that uh, future gene pro breeding programs can specifically target. And there's a lot of people I need to acknowledge. Uh, all my committee members and members of the Monroe Lab. Uh, my, the Monroe Lab is a part of the Haskins Shellfish Research Laboratory, which is a consortium of shellfish scientists at Rutgers University. And a lot of the uh, technicians and staff at the Haskin Lab uh, were instrumental in conducting this research. Uh, and then also the New, the New Jersey Aquaculture Innovation Center, where the research was conducted. Um, and technicians, uh, undergraduates, uh, and uh, facilities technicians uh, all were uh, enormously helpful in conducting this work, as well as our partner farmers at 40 North, Parsons Seafood, and Bill Avery Plains. And my funding, agent, my funding agents were NOAA Sea Grant, uh, New Jersey Sea Grant, Sea Grant Scientific, and the Northeast there. And with that, I'll take your questions, or I guess I'll take your questions after uh, Long Juan gets to go. Thank you very much. Exactly so. Please put uh, questions for Mike in the chat box over on your right. And um, we'll look forward to addressing them during, during the joint Q&A at the end. Thank you so much for that presentation, Michael. That was really interesting. Um, our second presenter today is Long Huan Zhu from University of Maine. And please bear with me for just one moment while I call up his presentation. Sure. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Long Huan Zhu, a PhD student in civil engineering at University of Maine. Today, I'm going to talk about the green alternatives to wave attenuation in a changing climate. Climate change expected to result in an increase of occurrence of the extreme events such as swells forms, sea level rising, and so on. The extreme events not only cause damage to our coast environment and communities, but also threaten our lives and properties. Um, for example, during Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and is 1,500 people lost their lives. Except the string events, the climate change can also impact our marine ecosystems. Like the first um, impact is uh, warming. Climate-driven warming could reduce the vertical mix mixing of the ocean water that brings nutrients from the deeper water. And warming and altered ocean circulation could also reduce the supply of oxygen in um, deeper water. Both reduced nutrition at the surface and reduced oxygen at the depth could impact the ocean productivity. Another significant effect from climate change is um, ocean uh, acidification. Ocean absorbed a quarter of human caused emission of carbon dioxide annually, thereby changing seawater chemistry and decreasing pH value. The 
ocean acidification is expected to continue in the future due to the interaction between atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and uh, ocean water. So warming and ocean acidification could impact the marine food chain and also impact our habitats. For example, the warming and ocean acidification could threaten the coral reef habitat. And the ocean acidification could reduce the growth and survival of shellfish. So to in, in mitigate, uh, mitigate the impacts of changing in environment, changing climate, we found that seaweed could be a good choice. On one hand, the seaweed can reduce carbon dioxide and provide oxygen by photosynthesis. And on the other hand, the seaweed can also protect our shorelines by damping wave energy. Mark Mayer says that um, a 258 meter long tail bed could reduce 70% to 85% wave energy. However, the seaweed aquaculture is a uh, little different fr um, from the kelp bed in the form. So my objective in this study is to quantify the wave attenuating capacity of seaweed aquaculture farms. Mm. The, the picture is that the kelp farm, uh, the, the kelp blade is suspended in the um, sea water, which is different from the kelp at the bottom. And we are going to develop a wave attenuation model to predict the wave energy behind the kelp farm. Then we can calculate the wave energy reduction by comparing the wave energy behind the kelp farm and the wave energy before the kelp farm. Firstly, uh, we'll introduce the analytical model, which is easier. In this model, the aquaculture farms are modeled as suspended structures consisting on vertical flat plates. Then we assume that the wave energy loss is induced by the work performed by the kill farm drag. Then uh, solving the wave energy conservation equations can is uh, wave height reduction rate. Then we can get the wave energy reduction through the, this um, formulas. Before applying this model to, to our field, we would validate this model. Then we compare the model with, um, with the field measurement from a master farm um, performed by in New Zealand. Uh, in this month, the mass of line is 650 wa meters wide, and they made the waves before the mass of line and behind the mass of line. So we can calculate the wave attenuation. Um, in this part, the red line indicates the results from our model, and and the result uh, the comparison and the results showed um, favorable agreement with uh, mail data. Then we'll use this model to analyze the wave attenuation capacity of seaweed. Um, in so the we selected a storm as a in the scenario. The study site is selected as Sackle Bay in May, and the storm selected 
is uh, happened dur during the Patriots Day in 2007. During the storm, the, the significant wave height can reach to 3.4 meter, and the associated P wave period ranges from 3.2 second to 12 second. Then, if we um, place a farm in this area, then we can um, calculate the wave energy reduction for the for the farm with um, five meter wide, the wave energy reduction could range from ten percent to thirty percent. And if we yeah, enlarge the size of the farm, the wave energy reduction can can be almost doubled to twenty percent to fifty percent. So, uh, so the care farm can be used as a living bay water to protect the shorelines from from the uh, ocean environment, wave energy, wave environment. So uh, what's the advantages of the seaweed aquaculture in the hardened structures like um, bay waters? Firstly, the seaweed aquaculture is ecological and sustainable. As mentioned before, the seaweed can reduce carbon dioxide um, concentration to prevent the ocean acidification. And also, the seaweed can provide um, ox oxygen-rich habitat. What is uh, most important is that the cost of the seaweed aquaculture is much lower than the hardened structures. And, in case, uh, and the seaweed aquaculture can also pro provide food for us. But the problem is that seaweed aquaculture, uh, the seaweed can only grow during the winter, like a, from December to June. So, so the seaweed aquaculture um, can only serve as bird waters for the area where the storms uh, usually happen in the winter, like the New England area. Besides, we also compare the seaweed aquaculture and the other nature-based infrastructures, like seagrass. Um, so for seaweed aquaculture, uh, it is suspended. So, so it is located in the uh, in the surf uh, the surface with a uh, uh, wave energy concentrate. So the seaweed aquaculture can get more wave energy than the bottom rooted um, um, plants, and. And besides, uh, seaweed aquaculture has no um, there's no limit depth limit to the seaweed aquaculture, so we can design uh, design the seaweed aquaculture to the size we want, so it can be uh, much larger than uh, than the natural habitat. In addition, the seaweed aquaculture is suspended. It is um, floating associated with the buoys. So the, the sea level rising or the storm surge has less impact on the seaweed aquaculture. But that's the wave alternate age, um, at wave alternate aging capacity of seagrass can be um, much less during storm surge or high tide. So our conclusion is that seaweed aquaculture can be an ecological and sustainable alternative to dead wave energy in a changing climate. Um, in the, our, for the future work, what we are going to do is uh, we have done some experiments 
uh, to study the wave attenuation capacity of the seaweed aquaculture. In the experiment, we use silicon foam material to model the kelp blade. And so, unfortunately, uh, we cannot play an animation to show you the experiment. And, and I also um, haven't finished the data process yet. And, and we also use numerical models to simulate the interaction between the waves and curl blades. Then we can see the feedback of the um, blade motion to the flow field. So, uh, like in this um, pictures, we can see the vorticities around the tail blades. Then we can use this model to simulate the nutrients distribution, nutrients on oxygen distribution of the uh, in the in the in the flow. Okay, so that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lang Han. And um, now it's time to move into our Q and A in just a moment. But first, I would like to remind you about upcoming webinars in this series. Um, the next will be. November 27th at 10 a.m. featuring presentations from Kyle Dittmer and Joe Walls. So I'm li really looking forward to hearing from them. Uh, and a reminder that you can find out more about uh, upcoming webinars as well as past webinars in this series and uh, see archived recordings on our website, which is linked at the bottom of the screen there. Um, all right, so I'll leave this up as a, a backdrop for now, and we can move into some questions. Uh, First one for you, Mike. Um, are, clam, are these clams sensitive to coastal acidification? Is coastal acidification a concern in your study area? Does acidity influence temperature tolerance? There's a three for one. Uh, so my group isn't uh, looking at the effects of acidity on uh, our coastal bivalve species. Uh, there are certainly other people who are. Um, from what I've read, uh, uh, clams are most vulnerable to ocean acidification during their larval phase or right after they metamorphose. Um, but I don't know specifically um, how OA is affecting surf clams or uh, would affect surf clams on farms. At this point in time, it's not much of an issue. But it, of course, could be down the road. Great, thanks. Uh, now, next, a question for you, Long Juan. Um, is the use of seaweed on aquaculture farms considered a normal practice? Um, Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Did you hear the question? No, okay, can you repeat it? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. So is the use of seaweed on aquaculture farms a common practice? Uh, not yet, but we have, um, so, we collab collaborate with um, the University of New England, and they have um, deployed some uh, aquaculture, aquaculture uh, the, the kelp long lines there. And we are going to do some field work there to see how the uh, kelp farms work in the field. OK, cool. Um, I definitely have heard about um, seaweed being farmed as a sea vegetable, and I'm not sure what species are used for that, but um, it's definitely something I've heard of and don't know very much That's about. Really lovely. <laughs> yeah, so That's it's really lovely. Lovely. Uh, Next up, question, uh, question for you, Mike. Um, did you test whether the clams will survive if exposed to heat for a couple of days and then placed in cooler water, or do they have to be in heat for six days for it to cause mortality? or heat for over six days? So surf clams could survive for um, a, a short period of time in, in hot water. Uh, it depends on their size and also their condition. So um, a, a big adult surf clam that might be caught in a wild surf clam fishery that's maybe four inches or seven inches long won't last more than a couple days 
uh, when the water is above 25 or 26 C. Um, but really small surf clams, like the juveniles I was working with, you could get animals in two or three weeks as hot as 26 degrees and, and fare really well. So the size and age of the surf clam um, are, are important factors and also the uh, exact temperature of water. Um, and we also think that food availability is um, really important and oxygen concentration. So if surf clams have enough food and enough oxygen, they're more likely to withstand the hot water stress than if they're food limited, which in the summertime in, in coastal bays, New Jersey, uh, th those things are often related. All right, and uh, Long Han, who maybe his connection wasn't 100%, just put in the comment box, uh, Saco Bay is, has seriously suffered from coastal erosion, which is in part induced by waves. So that's the answer to my next question, which was, are there parts of the coast that are more vulnerable to wave attenuation? It sounds like, um, yeah, there are areas in Maine, at least where that's a significant concern in Castle yeah. Bay. So thanks for addressing that. Um, I guess I'll, uh, I'll ask another one for Mike. Um, this is from Kyle. Mike, do you know why the Gulf of Maine is warming at such a faster rate relative to other areas? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it has to do with um, changes to the Gulf Stream and changes to the Labrador Current. So the Gulf of Maine is fed by water from the Gulf Stream coming from the south, from water, warm water coming from the equator, and the Labrador Current brings cold water down from the Arctic. And I think changes in the temperature and salinity of those um, of those currents uh, have caused uh, the Gulf of Maine uh, to heat so quickly. And I think likely also the bisymmetry of the bay, um, so like the depth and the topography underwater, has something to do with it as well. Cool. Thanks. And Long Juan can feel free to jump in uh, if you've got more to add to that as well. Um, Mike had asked whether Long Juan is going to an upcoming conference, and, and yes, it looks like you're both yes. you'll both be going to the NACE conference. So, uh, awesome, fun, fun connection oh, cool. there. Um, all right, another question for uh, that I saw for Long Juan is uh, um, Ivan asks: Are sea squirts a problem for wave attenuation strategies, particularly for kelp farms? And I'm I'm not even sure what a sea squirt is, but uh, Long Juan, if, if you know, feel free to jump in with that. <laughs> no, actually, I, I honestly didn't know what is sea, sea squirts. Uh, yeah, so I'll just time it. So it's a, a species that's starting to you know, it sort of become uh, quite populous, and it, it occupies the substrate, and so it's crowding out other species, and uh, it's kind of a long tube thing been in the news cycle in the last 48 hours, actually, because of, of its relative abundance. So I was wondering if that was a problem for some of these farms or if you'd experience it. I wonder if that's more uh, in, in areas that are growing on substrate on the coast rather than offshore floating farms. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Well, yeah. Uh, I learned something then, new. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I, I need to do some research on that, <laughs> so I cannot um, answer this question right now. No problem. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question uh, for Mike. Brooke asks, has the surf clam industry felt the effects of climate change yet, and uh, in what ways? Uh, that's a good question. I think I forgot to mention that uh, there actually is a lucrative wild surf clam fishery already. Uh, so um, there's a so if you ever had um, like clam chowder or fried clam strips in the you know uh, at a restaurant or something, you've likely already eaten surf clams. But those surf clams almost certainly came from wild individuals that um, live in different stocks extending from uh, like the Delmarva Peninsula right south of New Jersey all the way up to New Brunswick, Canada. Uh, and then um, my focus is studying uh, farmed Atlantic surf clams, so the same species, but we grow them to a smaller size, um, again, primarily because uh, it takes too long for the clams to get up to that big size, and uh, before they got to that big size, they would succumb to heat uh, mortality. 
but yes, the surf clam industry has felt the effect of climate change. Uh, so there's really great evidence of the surf clam stocks moving northward. Um, so like the the point uh, along the coast where uh, you know the the mean the, the mean of the population uh, has been consistently moving north for the past 30 years. Um, so that will have effects for um, the fishing fleet uh, in the southern part of its range. They'll have to um, use. Oh, we've lost sound on you, Mike. Are you still there? Hmm. I see that uh, that Mike is still online, but we've lost sound for you. So if uh, if your call dropped, feel free to call in again, Mike. Um, and in the meantime, um, Mike, are you back? In the meantime, um, I'll I'll ask this question. Uh, Kara had put a question in the chat box. Um, what about this strategy in combination with living shoreline practices or efforts? And then uh, put a link in the in the comments box. So um, yeah. it sounds like that's another um, Climate Hub project to check out that maybe is um, has some uh, similarities or maybe of interest to uh, folks who were presenting today. Yeah. Yes. Are you back, Mike? Yes, I'm back. I'm sorry about that. That was strange. No problem. Glad to have you back on the line. Uh, did you did you hear uh, the question about um, this ongoing effort through the Climate Hub? Uh, no, I have not. I don't. I wasn't sure if I if my uh, if my answer was heard by anyone anyway. No, uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, I've got another okay. question for you. Looks like, okay. Uh, Kara says that addressed hers. So. Um, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, uh, but I have one more question for you, Mike, and that's uh, if you're rearing clams uh, right close to the coast, is water temperature usually constant, or is there uh, quite a bit of variability with daily cycles or rainfall inputs? And you you halfway addressed this saying that that tidal cycles are really important, but um, I was curious if you had anything anything else to add to that. Yeah. So the temperature along the coast. Um, is, is really always changing. Um, one of the other parts of my uh, dissertation research that I haven't uh, addressed here uh, is that we've done surf clam <laughs> row-out trials along different points of New Jersey's uh, back bays. And um, at those trials, we've had temperature and salinity loggers out um, capturing measurements every 10 minutes for the past two years. So we have a really great idea of how each one of these farms um, uh, what their what their temperature and salinity profiles are, and that'll help us um, make decisions about where to uh, site surf clams, but also other other species like oysters or hard clams or scallops. Um, so, you know, if you're closer to the uh, really close to the coast, of course, rainfall will be uh, an issue for you. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's 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 no farm in New Jersey where the temperature will be exactly the same, uh, you know, longer than a day. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, and I see in the comments, uh, Long Juan has also jumped in to address uh, Kara's <laughs> And shout out to you, Long Juan. It says you've drafted a paper talking about the combination of aquaculture farms and living shorelines for wave attenuation. So um, congratulations on, on getting that done. Sounds pretty interesting. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's that's all the questions that, that I saw come up. Um, if anyone has last burning questions, go ahead and, and type them in. But uh, otherwise, I'd love to extend a, a big thank you to our presenters today, Michael Aquafreda and Long Han Ju. It's been really fun hearing from you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It looks like if, uh, I see a little dot about the chat box. Someone's typing a comment. Um, Brooke says, thank you, Mike and Long Han. Interesting talk. All right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.